Wow, so glad we did not include those last segments. Oh my gosh, we would have lost all of our listeners. Welcome to the Nose Up Podcast. I'm Father Michael. And I'm Father Josh. And I'm not Father Joe. I'm not Father Joe. Regular Joe. <laughs> Sad. Um... But, uh, so we're, three dudes are here. Mm. Molly, uh, is delayed in Maryland, USA, because of snow. And, uh, so here we are. We're subbing in. Well, you're subbing in. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Father Michael substituting for Father Michael. For, yes. Stand in. Yeah. So we, we kind of had a top, we talked about the, we, maybe we could talk about the epiphany and maybe that could be a. A starting off point because today is the epiphany and christmas is over tomorrow tomorrow yeah let's not let's not rush that as this yeah. comes out tomorrow yeah. <laughs> yeah so joe what does the epiphany mean to you <laughs> oh wow where do i start which of the three kings is your favorite <laughs> i like the guy that bought frankincense and i don't know mer too but i just feel like both the other guys had to be like you brought what? Dude, you're making us look bad. It's like the one sibling that gets a much better gift for the sibling gift exchange. And you're like, dude, come on. I think if any of them are trying too hard, it's gold. Mm. Well, it depends on how much, right? Okay. Like, imagine if there was, like, I don't know, a chest full of frankincense, a bag full, sack full. I don't know. And then, like, I don't know, maybe it was like a, could have been a small amount of gold. Well, since Molly's not here, we'll have to speculate. But if you're a young family, mm -hmm. you just had a child. What is going to be more useful in the in the immediate time frame? A chest of frankincense <laughs> <laughs> or any amount of gold? <laughs> yeah, the gold. Yeah. Yeah. They just burn it at home, the frankincense. Mm. I mean, it was a stable. It probably didn't smell that great. That's Maybe they true. were like, Frank oh, this. Just, just hand me the match. Yeah, they didn't have matches. <laughs> So maybe it was one of Baby Jesus' first scent memories. Incense. Incense. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I like that idea. Hmm. I know. So I know I've heard that that gold would presumably have been what made the flight to Egypt possible because they would have left everything immediately. Yeah. And that's how they would have kind of made their way there. And then I never thought it up there. Well, yeah, because they would have had to have leave left straight from Bethlehem. Like, they're not going back to Nazareth to pack up or grab anything or mm -hmm. right, anything like that. Yeah. Just straight from, like, one moment they're going to the census and the next they're fleeing to Egypt. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Have you guys heard anything about, like, about, like that, about the frankincense or the myrrh? I mean, the symbolic. Yeah, just the symbolic of, like, frankincense for acknowledging the presence of God mm. and myrrh for his burial. But I, I wonder what would it what they would have done with it in that time frame? Did like and again, it was it a chest of frankincense or hmm. a bag or whatever? But yeah, just that how precarious everything is is really astounding, and how God would provide for them in that way is really amazing. Hmm. Interesting thought too is like what <clears throat> is a so the gold they probably used pretty early on, mm -hmm. like right away to get down there. The myrrh, I have no idea if this is accurate. I always thought, like, growing up that Mary saved it and, you know, anointed Jesus at his death. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. actually accurate or not. But then at what point would they have even used frankincense, you know? Could they bring it to the temple or something? They could, is but then offering? you're, you're like, fast-forwarding, like, 12 years, that's right? That's true, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's a mystery. Hmm. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Um, we were talking, or no, maybe Deacon Bob preached about it. What do you think the star was? What do you think was really going on there? Was it a star? Was it a conjunction of a couple planets? Was it a purely supernatural event? Hmm. So I saw this. This was, oh gosh, this was years ago. Uh, and I can't even remember what the name of it was, but it was like this DVD. <laughs> and this guy had some sort of computer program where he had like mapped out 
or figured out what the like star positions were uh, around that time. But I think because we're not really sure that Jesus was born in zero BC, Mm -hmm. you know, that's kind of a little arbitrary. So he was going back. I think, I think he went to like four BC or something. And I can't remember everything, but it was like, there were weird constellations with like Regulus, which is the, uh, one of the stars, um, which is like the King star. And then the constellation Virgo, which is the Virgin. Uh, And I don't know. It was like, it was just how the pattern was mathematically. What, would have Mm -hmm. happened uh he was kind of postulating that it would have seemed especially if they're looking at constellations and like oh these are signs telling a story or something it would have seemed like a a cane being born from a virgin Mm. um and then it did this weird like loop-de-loop like like normally they have this this trajectory but then just how the position of how it would have looked from earth would have looked like it would have stopped in the same place for a while okay um so I thought that was kind of cool, but I can't remember the details of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've heard of that before. Someone had explained it to me. I remembered, like, it was a a crazy sequence of constellations. I don't remember what it was. It's an interesting thing. Like, yeah, that they would have the faith to, to, or I guess, like, from their own wisdom and understanding to be like, okay, this means something in the sky. Which today would be like, no, that doesn't, that's not true, mm. uh, astrology. But like the, but then that it would lead them to a particular place is really astounding. Yeah. Um. So it has to. Yeah. There's a lot going on there. The, I think how, what I think I heard this quote once that how it was described was like like the problem with astrology is that it thinks that like the stars determine events mm-hmm, here. Mm-hmm. And what we're kind of saying is, no, like, they don't determine the events, but God can use the stars to point people to something. Yeah, mm-hmm. announce you know, like, the event. Right. Mm-hmm. Which is just so cool that he would, in a sense, speak the language yeah. that these, well, pagans, you mm-hmm. know, would yeah. then follow. Yeah. When almost the turning on its head where it's it's the event on Earth that dictates how the heavens ought to be. Ooh. Yeah. Because for the first yeah. time in history, something... Like the the most important thing in the whole cosmos is here on Earth, mm. Mm. greater than all the stars. I'll drink to that. Mm. Cheers. <laughs> Happy Epiphany. Mm-hmm. Mm. We were drinking Angels Envy too, so I don't know the tie in there, but the the angels are they envious of the incarnation? The fallen angels. Mm. Sure. Yeah. I don't know. I don't what know that says about the bourbon fallen. we're drinking. <laughs> <laughs> The thing that struck me this time hearing the the gospel and then hearing uh, a couple different deacons preach on it this weekend was that uh, so like these pagans, they come to Jerusalem, they go to Herod, who's not the greatest guy. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he and he's like he's worried about it. He doesn't want competition. But then they go to the uh, I don't remember if it says the chief priests and the scribes, basically religious leaders. Um, and they can tell them where the king's supposed to be born, but like they don't go to, hmm. they don't go to Bethlehem. They don't, they're not like, oh, let's go find this newborn king. And it made me think, okay, what was going on there? Either uh, they thought, like, well, these pagans, why would they be asking about this? Why would they have anything to do with it? Hmm. Or maybe even they were just so, they were, uh, I don't know. Uh, so afraid of Herod? Afraid of Herod or like cynical in their belief that like, well, this isn't how it's going to happen. Like kind of presuming that mm. that it that yeah, that's what will happen, but it can't be happening now. And just yeah. that idea that like that yeah, the people that should have been most excited about the Messiah being born were not the ones who went to Bethlehem to meet Jesus. And it's like I never thought of this before, but what you're saying is like it's not that they were completely clueless. They yeah. literally have these foreign you know magi showing up Mm -hmm. and they don't even bother to like check it out themselves yeah yeah wow and what would have happened if they had gone would they have been disappointed that it's just Mm. a poor baby and a poor family and i feel like i keep coming back to this every episode but the whole thing of like that the messiah coming reveals the the line of david that Mm. that would show the this is where the king is um, but they they don't seem very interested. Mm. Yeah. 
This was striking me at mass. I didn't really know where to take it, but just the idea that Herod's response is, and his heart was greatly troubled. So obviously the things Herod does are bad, mm-hmm. but before any of those, it's his automatic response is he's troubled. And to have lived the life and to put yourself in this position where you hear the thing that ought to be your hope has happened, mm-hmm. and it it's greatly troubling. Yeah. Like your heart's that kind of set against the very hope you ought to have. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Versus these kings who, who were so, I don't know, able to hope that on, I don't know, the the faintest hope, the star in the sky, they were able to make this entire journey. I don't, yeah. To a land that wasn't theirs, to like a king that wouldn't be their king, at least according to human terms, that mm. he's, you know, he's the king of the Jews. Um what does that have to do with them? But they saw it as important and significant and just that God could work through even. Yeah. Cause like we talk, it's just really significant that it's these Gentiles that, that come first. Well, it would also seem some, some crazy way. They, they also expect like, like it's a King who wouldn't be their King, but they're bringing him frankincense, which mm-hmm. means they recognize now they probably don't think of it as like one God. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm but recognize divinity there. A God. A God. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they do him homage. You know, he's mm-hmm. not like, it's not like they're just coming, oh, we want to just pay our respects. You know, they. Yeah, they prostrate themselves. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Deacon Bob said in his homily, uh, what is it in the Greek? It's they threw themselves down mm-hmm. before him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a really interesting feast. I like that this is the feast to come at the end of the Christmas season. Um, there's so much about Jesus's childhood that we don't know, and we just get these little, little glimpses. But this would be so astounding for. It's already weird that the shepherds come to Mary and Joseph. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, they're like, who are these people? Um, but then these total strangers from another country who followed a star here suddenly show up to to pay homage to your child uh just the like the impression that would leave throughout jesus's childhood even as they run off to egypt to to escape from herod and all those things they would uh it, yeah, it would just like make such an impression about what's going to happen with this kid mm-hmm. in the future yeah it must have kind of blown saint joseph's mind like some these kings show up and he's probably thinking like I didn't even know I was going to be in this stable like mm-hmm. tonight. You oh, know, I was yeah. trying to get like a place somewhere else. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How would you guys know I was going to be in this stable tonight? Mm-hmm. You know, it just shows that God's behind it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So how has the Christmas season as it ends, how has it been for you this year? Hmm. For me, it's been really good. I think on one hand, uh, it's... Whenever Christmas is on a Monday, it's odd. Mm-hmm. I mean, one because you have just like like the the Sunday masses, and then and the then, marathon. Yeah, the marathon. Mm-hmm. But then also, what it does is it shortens Advent by like a week. Yeah, you know, or because uh, the fourth the fourth week of Advent lasted like twelve hours or mm-hmm. something, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, and so on one hand, it felt like really rushed going into it for me because like shorter preparation time and everything. Um. But I don't know. Yeah, it's it's been really it's been really good. It helps that school's out, so things feel a little slower for mm-hmm. me in that sense, you know. Yeah. Hmm. How about you, Joe? Yeah, I'd say I'm used to there being a lot more of the themes of hope, peace, and joy just in my own spiritual life around mm-hmm. Christmas. And I was a little bit surprised. It was kind of spiritually a quieter Christmas for me. I it was kind of literally because I was in my house. The three other guys were all away for about the week around Christmas. Um, so just a bit more quiet and reflective of a time. But I think the the verse that came up on Christmas Eve for me was the light shines in the dark. A, a few, the light shines in the darkness and you know, a light to reveal himself to the nations. And uh, yeah, I was just kind of surprised at that quieter message of just, the the world's in darkness and now there's light and mm-hmm. not like an abundance of light like 
one light, but then a light that never goes out and a light that only from then on spreads. So yeah, it's kind of been a, I don't know, an invitation to a quieter reflection, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about yourself? Yeah, it was like both of you said, that sort of how things slow down after the actual day of Christmas is always very welcome. Um, yeah, and I think that sitting quietly with the light, I think, is a good theme for me of just like that um, there wasn't a ton going on. It wasn't like, uh, you know, spiritually exciting. It was more just like I'm going to stay here with with what's going on. And I think, like, the fact that we have the readings that go on throughout the Christmas season and, like, uh, the Feast of the Holy Family and then the Feast of the Epiphany, um, it's not like it stretches it out, but, like, it gives you more to hang on to, and that was helpful for me that it's not just... It's not just like, all right, Christmas, I'm going to really be Christmassy, white-knuckle it through two weeks <laughs> or whatever, but it's, but it's very much... Uh, kind of like here are these things that that point to the deeper meaning of what's going on and so like especially this weekend of thinking about the the magi coming and what that means for me was like a really good gift of uh yeah just kind of like continuing to unfold christmas which is nice i hate that on tuesday it will be ordinary time yeah it just feels too abrupt. Yeah. Even if there were, you know, all these days of Christmas, it's just, it's suddenly, yeah, it feels like a, it's just like a hard stop. Mm. Well, it's crazy is that like, even with the shorter Advent, our Advent's longer than our Christmas mm -hmm. season, you yeah. know, that just feels a little, because it's not like that with the Easter season. Right. Easter's you know, forever. Long. Yeah, it's yeah. like you have and Lent is like double forever. Hmm. But <laughs> I mean, you have Lent but then the Easter season is actually longer, I think, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Um, which is nice. It's like a nice way of It's like, oh yeah, we we fasted and we did mm -hmm. penance and everything, but now we we feast and party even more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, have you guys already talked about this the indulgence, the the indulgence for nativity sets in no. Franciscan churches? Mm -mm. Okay, cuz uh the there, it's not a clear answer of when the Christmas season exactly ends, right? There's the octave of Christmas, and then Chris, you go into ordinary time after. Mm -hmm. Is it baptism that it is ordinary time or the day after? I think the day after. Okay. Uh, but then also kind of traditionally, the Feast of the Presentation, February 2nd, kind mm -hmm. of ends Christmas season in its own way. And did you Have you heard about this indulgence? Nope. The, it's okay. because it's the anniversary of the first crash? Yeah, the okay. 800th anniversary. So... Uh, so it's in any Franciscan church praying in front of the nativity scene in a Franciscan church uh, is, you know, a cause for a plenary indulgence mm -hmm. until February 2nd. Oh, which seems to indicate that Christmas keeps going. Thanks. I'm trying to think of what that department of the Vatican is called. The Department Pen of Penitentiary Christmas? or something. <laughs> There's a secret Department of Christmas that's been. Oh, can you imagine trying the dicastery for Christmas? Mm. I would, I would be applying. I would uh -huh. be trying to get in there so hard. Do you think they're elves, or is that just where my mind goes? They are guy. They're probably guys in pointy hats. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very cool. So that's uh, that seems to point to a longer. Christmas Eve, and even if we're wearing green, yeah, uh, during part of that. And what's funny this year is so February second, the some sort of spiritual end of the Christmas season, and then February fourteenth is Ash Wednesday. Yeah. Oh, is it? Is yeah. It, oh, wait, wasn't gotta, that just a few years ago? We had yeah, that too. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, that, that's that, great. I find that as a person. As a celibate person, <laughs> that's right. I find it hilarious that yes. Ash Wednesday is on Valentine's Day. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> Real love looks like fasting. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a meme the other day. It was just like, "Do you think the nativity guys ever got together later and were and had a beer and were like, hey, remember that baby we saw?'" <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was a joke, but it made me think about that. Like, 
the shepherds and and the magi like did they like they weren't necessarily around to see what happened yeah uh with jesus's life and ministry that's i mean 30 years later um like looking back because they, maybe they never got to see the fruition of what mm -hmm. they were promised that day that night um and who, when the magi came we don't know when they came mm -hmm. we put them in the in the nativity scene but <laughs> whatever but uh yeah just like that idea of of they saw some like a really great promise and and kind of like just had to wait on that and, and maybe never see the end of that yeah yeah you would imagine if i don't know some of the shepherds were teenagers they probably yeah were, but like guys who are older mm -hmm. you know probably not what's also funny that reminds me too of like uh when it says john the you know john the baptist is born the whole like town like talked about it for a yeah. bunch because like it you know Zachariah was struck dumb and then like you know, older. he begins to speak and, yeah. yeah and it's just kind of like I wonder if that kind of helped set the stage mm. for when yeah 30 years later but John begins his ministry and then eventually Jesus there probably were some people who were like that's that kid you yeah know? <laughs> like we we knew something was gonna happen that's Zachariah's <laughs> boy yeah, yeah yeah I mean not the not with the scribes and the Pharisees but with yeah. some of the I don't know, maybe the poor shepherds, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It's funny, the last line of the gospel today, I was thinking about that bit, that's a bit too, where it's like, and then they left by a different path and went home. Mm -hmm. It's like, how? How do you not say, okay, I don't, I don't know exactly what the wise men knew about this guy, but okay, this is super important. When do you make the decision? Like you just look around and you have that awkward moment. It's like the end of Ocean's Eleven, you know, where they're all just staring at the fountain and feel off one by Do one. we leave? Yeah. Yeah. Was it like that climactic, quiet Claire de Lune is playing in the background? Do they look at each other and be like, I mean, it's getting kind of late. <laughs> we have a long drive. Yeah. Like, did, did they stick around for a few days? Did a few that would weeks? make sense. Maybe. But at the same time, that actually speaks to me. And maybe that's just like interpreting it and you know, categories today, but that they probably weren't supposed to stay. Mm. The Lord wasn't probably inviting them like, yes, you're to accompany the Holy Family this whole time. The Lord deeply desired for these three men to have this profound experience of, of encountering his son and then intended that to stop and for yeah. them to go home. And I don't know if they became <clears throat> evangelists or you know what they did but that's kind of a crazy thought though too you talk about like pr kind of preparing the way like whatever countries they came from did they come back have some sort of account of this is what we found and then you fast forward how many years where whatever apostle yeah. showed up there yeah and like mm -hmm. did that help to evangelize those mm. countries like very you know? small seeds were planted that could open the way for well, here's the rest of the story. Right. Yeah. 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 Like a generation mm -hmm. later. Yeah. Or two or whatever. I thought of that today, too, of like, uh, did they hang around? And I was thinking of like hospitality as really important for for the people this time and place. And that they almost definitely would have welcomed them in and like taken them into their home. And just like we, you know, we have the the single image of. Magi coming, doing homage, opening their treasure boxes, like, but then just like sitting around the table or whatever the next day, yeah. uh, what all that was like. And then, yeah, when they decided, okay, this is what we were supposed to do. Now we have to go home. Um, yeah, that to me, that would be one of the great gifts of heaven is to like see the inside of some of these stories. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> I love to that idea. I think the way it words it is that they and they came in and saw the child with his mother. Yeah. So they don't see Saint Joseph. So it's like I mean he could have just been He's there, not but, mentioned, yeah. But it's almost like wait, wh where was he? Like he, his wife and child, he's leaving them untended and unprotected and, mm. and so I've heard a talk before that talked about how no no no, Saint Joseph would clearly have been the one at the door. Yeah. And if they they'd been unwelcome guests or, or threats he would have been in charge of turning them away yeah but he had to be the one who recognized them possibly not speaking much of the same language or, mm -hmm. he would have been the one that recognized them 
and recognized in them something from the Lord mm. and welcomed mm. them in. Yeah. And so that idea of St. Joseph, I, I think about that a lot in the Christmas season. They're just asking St. Joseph, help me to enter in and encounter our Lord and our Lady. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, just that role as him at least knowing part partly like just who this boy is and that he has an incredible responsibility. And I think that was that's what makes the flight to Egypt so powerful to me is that idea of like he got this message and he they leave immediately. Yeah. Um would be terrifying. Uh, we have that painting upstairs of the family on the way to Egypt and Mary and uh, Jesus are, are they sleeping kind of in the arms of the Sphinx statue? Yeah. And then Joseph's laying on the ground by the fire. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's really, it's a powerful way to identify with Jesus. Hmm. Yeah, we don't have a feast of the flight to Egypt, right? No, I don't think so. I wonder if there's one in an Eastern church or something like that. Mm -hmm. That'd be interesting to hear about. Yeah, I wonder if, like, the Copts, the, the Egyptian, right, if they have some special stories or traditions. I thought you here. said the Copts, like the, poli <laughs> the Egyptian police force <laughs> has a particular devotion to the flight to Egypt. The Copts. The Copts. Coptic yeah. Christians. Yeah. That would be hugely important. Mm -hmm. And is there anywhere in Egypt... That's like a a shrine or like hey, this is this, where they this stayed. is where they came yeah. yeah I bet there has to be yeah you know I know there's stories about like places they stayed or nearby mm. that you've heard this before of like the idols like throwing themselves down on the ground oh no I haven't heard that yeah I could see that it's one of those things where it's like I don't I don't know that it happened but there had to be a lot of cool things we didn't we haven't heard mm -hmm. about yeah. And even like, so Jesus going to Egypt, kind of like God's last big act in Egypt was not so pleasant for the Egyptians of mm. letting the, the Israelites go free. And now God coming as, as a baby mm. um, uh, that needs, that needs their help in a lot of ways, like needs mm. taken care of as a powerful image. Yeah. What is it from the, the consecration of St. Joseph, there are cool, a few awesome meditations about that. I think one of the ones that impacted me the most, uh, I think the section was called Savior of the Savior. Mm. It was like, Jesus to, to Jesus Christ, it was given to save all men, but to only one man was it given to save Jesus. Yeah. Now, this is St. Joseph, the one who preserved God's life from Herod. Mm -hmm. And then also like the idea that the patriarch Joseph in Egypt preserved the, the grain to be given out. And this is the one who preserves the bread of life himself to then go out to the nation. That's great. Yeah. Joseph. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Almost like it's the coolest name that could exist. <laughs> Besides for Jesus, yeah. or as some would say, Joshua. <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing. Go march around the wall. <laughs> Who is like the Lord. <laughs> My, Michael. Yeah. yeah, it's not bad. Uh -huh. I mean, he did he did some cool stuff, but yeah, the devil right out of heaven. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeeted him right out of heaven. <laughs> Yeeted him right out. Yeah. So he who is like God is that the meaning of it? Who is like the Lord? Like the Lord. Yeah, it's a question. Oh. Mm -hmm. Um, in the secular world, we also celebrate at this time uh, a new year, a new calendar year. Mm. Do you do anything particular with the new year? Like personally? Yeah. No. In fact, this is this is one of my contrarian sides. <laughs> I like All right. Yeah, it's like I never like purposely decided not to, but just as I don't know, I remember when I first heard about you new year's resolutions, I just I just bristle against that. And it it's irrational, I'll admit, but <laughs> yeah. It's like no, I don't do anything. <laughs> New Year, old me. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't do New Year's resolutions either. Yeah. I kind of see Lent around the corner, too. So it's like, ah, uh, I don't need to pregame. Let's Lent. not push yeah. this. Yeah, this yeah is a, right. It's a season for this, incidentally. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
it's so it's weird that like it's weird to live with sort of two calendars being a catholic that you know we like really mentally like okay we started again we're in advent leading towards christmas and that's kind of the big deal and then immediately right after christmas the the world is like oh this is this, this is, is the huge. start yeah. yeah this is the the new start yeah yeah it's very odd but it's <clears throat> oh, what was i going to say oh that exodus 90 i think started already Mm-hmm. with the new year right yeah that stinks <laughs> <laughs> I, i've never done it i have not done it either we were talking earlier about i haven't done it we were talking earlier about how you could just kind of i think i got water at dinner or something and i was like yeah exodus 90 and i'm like oh you're doing that i was like no but you can say that to all kinds of stuff and like why are you eating chocolate in the morning exodus 90 yeah pledge to watch six hours of tv every day it's hard work, but you got to build up that you, discipline. It's yeah. all about the habit. You know? That's mm-hmm. right. Yeah. I've been asked to be like a chaplain for a group. I just, like, I just don't think that would be good for me. Mm. Yeah. I Yeah. For any of you out there that do it, I have real respect for it. And especially mm-hmm. just the, the desire to build up those, that discipline and those habits. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know. Lent has... Lent has a, a very specific spiritual meaning, but it wasn't kind of d- designed psychologically for what will maximize the formation of the formation or breaking of habits. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, I like the idea in the abstract, non-practiced version. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm right there. But we don't need to talk about Lent; it's so far off. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. still Christmas. Right. Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. <laughs> it, it's it's nice to like especially upstairs here we always have in the evening the the christmas lights on and it's it's good to like plunge back into that after you're like you get away from it just that the world has already moved on the world moved moved on very quickly and Mm -hmm. to just be out be in the to soak it in again something i did on christmas this year was i read tolkien's father christmas letters um so he wrote for a long time like i think like 20 years wrote letters to his kids from santa father father christmas because he's british um (laughs) and uh and had like other characters like the the north polar bear and a different elf and there were goblins that attacked them and i'm just like oh yeah this guy's a genius (laughs) because of course it's tolkien so yeah his his father christmas letters would have goblins attacking it got much more elaborate than i thought it was going to (laughs) but it was it was a good christmas read I don't know too many other ones besides that and the Christmas Carol. Mm. Yeah, I don't know either. Uh, this is more recent, last few years, but I've like every year it seems like I'm just drawn more and more to the to a Christmas Carol. Mm-hmm. Just love that story. Yeah, the Muppet one in particular, but uh, of course, yeah. of course, yeah, <laughs> yes, the canonical version, yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's a powerful story. I preached about uh, It's a Wonderful Life for Christmas this oh, year. Oh, did you? Yeah, because we watched it Yeah, just a few days before that. And then I think what really struck me was the, like, divine providence in it that, like, most of the story is just here's George Bailey's life, and it kind of stinks sometimes. <laughs> and and But then, like, that all of the his friends and family calling out to God for him – and then him really making a desperate prayer to God and God just intervening in a way he did not expect that changes everything. Cause it wasn't like it didn't fix all his problems. It didn't let him leave, but it helped him see his yeah. life in a new way. Yeah. Yeah. With like gratitude. Yeah. There's something about that story. Ah, the, the just justice mongering side of me is ah, never fails to just hate what's his name uncle uncle oh, billy uh, uncle, uncle billy, billy yeah. yeah yeah like uncle billy if you didn't lose the money uh-huh. uh, and the realization that at the end that money isn't recovered yeah potter doesn't repent potter doesn't bring it back that money was stolen mm-hmm. and that that wrong was never righted but you see the the charity of 
what's his name again? How am I forgetting the main George? Character? George Bailey. I say Bill Bailey for something. But George Bailey, like the the way he's loved others and that, that kind of love bearing fruit and, and them all coming and, hmm. and his brother too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it covering up the, the wrong that was done and so much more. That's a great way. Yeah, that sort of abundance of generosity and charity that that fixes things in the end, not in the way that you would think. Right, not by like undoing the wrong. The yeah. wrong still happened and, and yeah, isn't ever kind of, I don't know, there are times where the, the potters of the world repent and that's difficult, mm-hmm. but yeah, it's that, it's not that evil doesn't just ceases abruptly, but that the the light shines so much more abundantly. Mm-hmm. Who was it we were talking to? I felt like we were talking to someone who made the point that um, just kind of tying in the two stories that it's like Potter is kind of a, a Scrooge-like character. Scrooge never repented. Oh, yeah. Mm, you know, yeah. but just seeing how both stories kind of. Interesting. Yeah. So I guess if you had, man, I can't remember characters' names today. Not Fred. Bob Cratchit. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. So if you have had Bob Cratchit just read a real point of reach a real point of desperation, he would just be George Bailey. Yeah. Interesting. If you were to recast that movie Ooh. today, who are some of the what are some of the on the spur of the moment decisions you would make? <laughs> Which one? It's a Wonderful Life. Yeah. Dwayne the Rock Johnson. As no question. Zuzu. No. <laughs> Play them all. No. <laughs> as George Bailey. It would be he'd be less pitiful if he was the rock. In I the sense like, of what is it that what's what makes George Bailey what makes Jimmy Stewart no. so appealing in that mm. though? He's like on one hand, he seems pretty like relatable, but on mm. the other hand, he also has those crazy eyes at the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I think just that desperation to get out of there. Yeah. It's so powerful because you like see the disappointment over and over again. Yeah. And you get to see his his optimism and his dreaming side kind of for others. Yeah. But for his own situation. And it's so it's so like that, where we can be so optimistic and someone else is going through such hard times. Mm-hmm. Like, Dude, it's gonna be all right. You're great. And then hard times hit you and you're like, Yeah, but but not for me. Yeah. Know. I feel like Robert Downey Jr. Would have done that well, huh? Hmm. I could see that. Oh, who's the guy? Jeff Bridges. Jeff Bridges for Potter. Oh, oh. okay. I was thinking, uh, who is the uh, the bad Duke in Dune, and he's in? Oh, Oscar Isaac. No, 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 he's no. The, the bat, and we just watched him in Chernobyl. Stellan Skarsgård. That's Potter. Oh. Yeah. He can be a real grumpy guy when he wants to be. <laughs> oh, I didn't realize he's the he's the bad duke in Dune. Under an enormous amount of prosthetics. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I don't know. Who's who's Clarence in the modern It's a Wonderful Life? Hmm. Jack Black. Jack Black. <laughs> I was just thinking because could... you said School of Rock earlier. Dan- but... Jack Danny... Black would be pretty good. Danny DeVito. <laughs> <laughs> I think kind of bumbling is good, or like I don't know, like a uh, trying to think of like a kind of angry comic. It's not going to happen, but that's okay. Yeah, I wouldn't want to watch that movie, <laughs> the postmodern. It's a well, wonderful life. If you had. If you had The Rock as George Bailey, you could have Kevin Hart as, as Kevin Clarence. Hart as Clarence. <laughs> that would be fun. That'd be amazing. You reverse it, so really, like, The Rock's just doing fine. Like, <laughs> Clarence got way over eagerness trying to help him out. Does not need help. Uh-huh. And it, it quickly becomes an action movie. Like, Potter actually <laughs> has a plan to blow up the building in Lone. Yes. Right. And turned it into Pottersville. Oh that my way. gosh. Yeah. I would watch this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The true spirit of Christmas. If if Disney got the rights to it's a wonderful life. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful life. Back for revenge. <laughs> nice. Well, 
I think that covers our Christmas adventures, mm. Epiphany adventures. Mm-hmm. So, Joe, how has God loved you lately? Oh, man. It is so hard to even remember time around this, like this time of year, because yeah. we just started into school on Wednesday. And yeah, so I don't even remember what, what life was like before school. <laughs> Break is already a distant memory. Um, yeah, let's see. I, just for New Year's, I just made a trip down to visit some friends in Virginia, and that was really fun. Um, and then, yeah, I, I'd say, you know what I'd say? It's the start of the semester, and being surprised by kind of the low motivation. Then going back in my in my journals from this time and previous years and realizing, oh, it's just always low motivation this time of year. In you or in your students? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I think it ever, and I think it, it's just the way of things. And it's mm-hmm. like, no one's quite ready to go back, but but it's time. And and so just realizing, and I think hearing just a message of patience from the Lord is saying like, yeah, it, it's okay to not feel fully prepped. It's okay to not be at peak energy. Mm-hmm. You You don't have to. You know, just come in and hit the first few days out of the park. Like, good, you, you did them, and keep going. So, yeah, his encouragement in that, I guess. That's great. Yeah. What about you, Father Josh? Yeah, I'd probably say um, the just in the thing slowing down. Right, now, it's starting to pick back up now. Mm-hmm. You know, but you know, since right after, yeah, Christmas and. That's been, yeah, really, really nice. Um, and tied in with that, a lot of good family time around Christmas time. Most of my most of my family was able to be in. Uh, they weren't visiting like you know the other spouses, you know, or not other spouse, but you know what in I mean. Laws. The spouses, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then this is the first time we've had uh, uh, like a couple babies around, so that's that's been really really nice. It's nice that I get to go home after, you know, and not, yeah. and not hear them cry all the time. But, <laughs> yeah. But that's been, yeah. It There's something about Christmas that, like, having little kids is mm. is part of it, you yeah, know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I would say for me, all those things are true. The one that's coming up is that tonight we had a, a dinner with our leaders of our Kairos retreat. So those seniors who, um, who led it a few months ago now. Um, and so just kind of getting back together with them and celebrating, you know, the accomplishment of the retreat, but also seeing their, just their kind of like positivity and energy and how funny they are and just fun to be around. That's always very encouraging, Mm. especially in the bleak midwinter. Mm. Yeah. I saw something, it was probably last year that, said it's weird that we want to be productive in a time of year when you're meant to like stock food and survive wolf attacks <laughs> that like that's that's what it feels like to me it's like we just need to to hunker down yeah we all survived yes cheers, cheers. cheers christmas <laughs> god bless us everyone. everyone and we'll be back next week molly should be back next week maybe the baby i don't know has the baby been on already? A few times, yeah. Oh, my gosh. She's been pretty quiet. She did a bunch of hiccuping one time. Oh. Yeah. I got to be careful. Unprofessional. Can't let, can't let her edge me out. As It might be as difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, so awesome. thanks for thanks for jumping in. Absolutely. You're welcome. Yeah. See you soon. Goodbye. Clink. Chin chin. Nice. <laughs>